Over the last several months, I've been living in this house in northern Portugal with my partner, Verity. We're learning new skills, reusing old materials, and trying to balance life working as freelancers while doing most of the renovation work ourselves. Follow along to see how we get on turning this abandoned house into a home. Hello and welcome back to another video. In last week's video, I showed myself moving bricks off a concrete roof. I'm standing on that roof. The bricks have been removed. There's a few over there actually. Later on in this video, I will show you what I plan on doing with this building, how I'm planning on upgrading the roof and developing the rooms downstairs. But before I get into that, this is what we got up to this week. <laughs> The first thing we tackled was to start preparing the old kitchen for painting. This meant that we needed to repair the space left by the old chimney hood which we had removed at the end of last year. We removed the flaking paint and the damaged plaster from the old cooking area and started to patch up and add plaster to the walls. We quickly realised that I had bought the wrong thing, it hardened within seconds and was almost impossible to apply to the walls. After a quick trip to the local builder's merchant, I bought something that worked better, but we're still not sure if it's the best or most cost-effective option. If you know the Portuguese name of what we should be using, please let me know in the comments. The plan was to skim coat the existing textured walls with a roller, something we had seen on YouTube. As you can probably tell, I'm definitely not a plasterer, but you have to start somewhere. One of my aims for the renovation is to do as much of it myself. I have no specific trade and I've sat behind a desk for most of my working life. This project gives me the opportunity to get my hands dirty and have some fun at the same time. This week we finally got around to having a bonfire. As you can imagine when we first moved into the house and land, there were lots of overgrown bushes, trees and lots and lots of brambles. And despite our best efforts, we didn't manage to clear and burn all of it before the winter came and the rain with it. So we took the opportunity to burn the remaining piles we had around the land. We're composting as much as possible and only burning non-compostable stuff. Back inside the house, we started to prep another room for painting. Combination of colder temperatures during the winter and increased indoor humidity eventually led to mold growing in some areas of the house. This was likely made worse by the installation of our new airtight windows. Ventilation is key and I'll be addressing this problem before next winter. The external insulation we plan on having installed will also help prevent mold growth too. In the meantime, we used an algicide on the walls and gave them a good clean in preparation for anti-mold paint next week. I also removed the skirting boards, revealing a year's worth of dirt and grime behind. Like we did in the other rooms, I'm planning on sanding, painting and refitting these skirting boards for the time being, but plan on replacing them in the future. Another project that we've been slowly thinking about was the perimeter fencing. In an earlier video, we added some temporary orange fencing attached to whatever we could to form some kind of barrier to prevent our dog from escaping. If you haven't seen an aerial view of the house and land, well, here it is. For now, we're going to fence the north and eastern walls of the land. We want to keep the wall to the south as is, and we'll be adding more stone to the lower areas. The wall to the west is the only one we share with our neighbor, and for now, we're going to leave it as it is. The fence will sit in front of the existing stone wall and will look almost identical to the fencing our neighbours have. We are reusing the metal posts that we harvested from the old vine arbours that spread across the garden in the past. Each metal post will sit between the granite posts that we have along the perimeter and a metal wire fence will be pulled between them. The first step was to mark out the positions of the holes that needed to be dug for the posts. This is all a bit of an experiment with ideas drawn from our neighbours and YouTube guides.
I stored the old metal from the vine arbors in our outbuilding. We have a few different lengths and thicknesses. I sorted through them to find as many posts long enough, but I think I'll have to use some shorter posts in some places. This is a root of a fig tree, I think. Come through the wall. The plan is to have a fair amount of the posts underground to help make them as solid as possible. At the bottom of each hole we will add gravel or some kind of rubble and fill the holes with fast setting cement. We are keen to get this done before the summer and have gone round in circles trying to think of the best way to do it. The fence will be 1.5 metres tall but I'm making the posts slightly longer to accommodate the length going underground. I'm thinking that if I need to, I can run a wire along the top to make even taller, but we doubt our dog Mila can jump this high anyway. I use the angle grinder to cut down most of the posts and get them ready to put in the ground. We borrowed a post hole maker from a neighbour. I'd seen these before but didn't realise how heavy they actually were. It turned out that our soil was fairly easy to dig and I only needed the metal pole and a spade to make the holes large enough for our posts. As the posts are metal and much smaller than typical wooden fence posts, the post maker was overkill. So that we can easily run the fence behind the granite posts as close to the wall as possible, we had to clear most of the vegetation back to expose the stone wall behind. Another of our goals for this year is to grow some of our own vegetables, something neither of us have done before. To get started, we measured the space to plot out three beds in a fairly sunny section of the garden. And yes, we know we need to cut the grass. 6.2 here. And that's the edge of the final bed. Maybe that's stone. Yeah. Perfect.
As the fence changes direction in the northeast corner of the land, I decided to use the chunkier metal bars that we had. This would hopefully make the corner stronger and it meant that I could use more of the metal we had lying around. We bought a couple of bags of fast setting cement from our local DIY store. It was a Saturday and it was the only one that was open. This first post will act as a test so we can figure out what works and how much of the actual cement we need to buy. Another project on the go is our camper van refurb. For those that don't know, we called this space home on and off for around three years exploring most of Europe in it. Over the years of adventuring, it has suffered some wear and tear. And as we are not able to transfer registration of it to Portugal, we are sadly gonna to have to sell it. To make sure it's in the best possible condition for sale, I'm gonna give it a deep clean, a repaint, and sort out some small issues with it. Okay, now onto the roof. As you can see, it was full of the previous owner's bricks, and over the past week, I've been removing them and placing them into three piles. The first pile contains the best condition, the second pile is for the okay bricks, ones that could be used if needed, and the third pile is full of the junk ones, ones that either fall apart when you pick them up or are in really bad condition. I plan on using these as hardcore for paths or in conjunction with a French train if I ever install one. Okay, it's not quite as epic as the music makes out, but finally, after several sessions of brick moving, the roof was clear and ready for the next phase. But before I do that, I decided to try and clean it as best I could with the pressure washer. Okay, so this is what the outbuilding looks like in 3D. The walls are made of stone in a random arrangement, also known as rubble stone wall or rubble masonry. Between these walls span concrete beams with terracotta blocks in between. This was then covered in a thin layer of concrete and what looks like some kind of liquid membrane on top. 
This view shows what I plan on doing. The change is subtle, but it will allow me to use this space as a roof terrace, entertaining space, and somewhere to hang out and enjoy the view. Because I want to use this as a terrace, the waterproofing gets a bit trickier as most of the products available for flat roofs are not suitable for people to walk on. I'm talking to companies for guidance, but haven't decided on the best option yet. So if anyone knows what works, please leave a comment below. As for the rooms within the outbuilding, they will eventually become an office and workshop space, maybe even somewhere for family and friends to stay. But before that, they will be used as a storage space, allowing us to clear out the ground floor of the main house and start the next project.